Hey, welcome back, everybody. My guests tonight are the co-hosts of Showtime's The Circus. Please welcome John Heilman, Mark McKinnon, and Alex Wagner. Hi, you three. Thanks for being here. Thank you. We're kicking it, kicking it hard. Yeah. It's not for the apocalypse. Just not for the apocalypse. Uh, that's exactly through. right. Well, you guys, the last time we talked together was election night, at the end of which we really did not know exactly what was going on. Now we know exactly what's going on, and it's extraordinarily harrowing. I know you guys were, all three of you were in D.C. this week. What is it like to be there with 15,000 National Guard troops on the streets? I mean, I'll tell you, as someone that grew up in Washington, D.C., I've never, ever seen the town like that. I have traveled to places, you know, on the Chad Sudan border and the Thai Burma border to places with very unstable governments. And it turns out that ours is just the same. I mean, it really feels like the stability that we have once known as a country uh, in terms of our government is gone. I, I, I do really think that like a lot of the security measures you see now, some of them are going to be permanent. I remember walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, driving down Pennsylvania Avenue in front of the White House when I was growing up. That is no longer happening. And in the same way, I would imagine that the Capitol is going to change a lot in terms of accessibility and what we expect in terms of precautions and danger in and around the nation's capital. That's a great point, Alex. It's just, you know, I, one of the things I love, I didn't grow up there, but since I've been there, the thing you love about it is that it's so accessible. You can really go anywhere. You can go, you can go right up by the White House. You can go right up to the Capitol. You can go by all the monuments. I couldn't even get to the Lincoln Monument yesterday. Um you know, the closest thing to compare this to in terms of a show of military forces after 9-11, how, how would you compare it to what Washington felt like after 9-11? Well, by then I had fled to New York City, <laughs> but I still had family living in the district. And there's, a, you know, I, I don't mean to be heavy handed about it, but there's a real sense of a loss of innocence. You know, you think back to those days and, and we took for granted, I think, um, our sense of safety and our sense of, um, you know, our place in the world and our, our leadership in the world and, and our, our invincibility as Americans. And I absolutely think the same thing has happened now. It's really an ADBC moment for the country in terms of, you know, what we can expect from American governance. Even I'd say, like, even, you know, if you compare to both Washington and New York in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, uh, you know, New York was n relatively back to normal within a month of 9-11. Of I mean, I remember, like, by the time, about a month after 9-11, like, you two came to town and played the first big gig at Madison Square Garden. You might remember that. It was, like, a big deal. And it never felt like the city was fully locked down. If you weren't right downtown, you know, if you were midtown, Upper West Side, Upper East Side, you didn't feel like a heavy military presence. And that was true in Washington, too. There were changes after 9-11, but... It never felt like the green zone, which is what it feels like now in Washington. It feels like, you know, and it's literally the, the, the things that got announced today in terms of the securing of the perimeter and how wide it's going to be and the, uh, the militarization of it. It literally is a green zone, and people are noting that in the coverage, kind of like, oh, we are really are like, it really is like Iraq. And um, I've never seen people in, this, in, this, in the district uh, as, as on edge about what might happen over the coming days between now and next Wednesday. I've never seen people more on edge, and that includes after 9-11. Well, the big difference, too, is that, you know, it was chilling at that time, but, but we were worried about people over there doing something to us. Now we're worried about people right here doing something to us. Mark, I know that you attended the president's rally at the eclipse before they marched over. What was the, what was the feeling in that crowd? Did, you know, t tell me what it was like to be, be there while the speeches were being made. Well, it was incredible, Stephen. I mean, it, for, it felt like being in a sea of human nitroglycerin, right? I mean, I've been in a lot of Trump rallies. This was different. People were not only animated, they were angry and on edge. And all it took was somebody to just shake this, you know, the, and combust this thing. And the president came out and did exactly that. I mean, I, I only would have been surprised if people hadn't gone and done something violent or break the law or, you know, create the kind of catastrophe and tragedy that we saw. Uh, the, you know, the fact is that uh, you think about how diabolical this whole thing was and how unsurprising the outcome was, because he said it before the election. He said, if I win, great. If I don't, it was stolen. And that was the message that he sowed to all these people who showed up at the Capitol. And then he said very clearly, he said, let's go to the Capitol. And if you want your country back, don't show weakness. So, 
I mean, what the hell did you expect them to do? I was not surprised. I was shocked at what they did, but I couldn't communicate with any of my colleagues because it was like being at you know a huge concert, so we couldn't get any cell phone coverage out. And I was worried as everybody went to the Capitol, I was worried about where my colleagues were. And then I discovered that Heilemann's down there in the middle of it, pretty close to the aftermath of some of the worst of it. I, I, we have a clip here, John. You were, you were outside the Capitol during the riot. Um, I'm not sure if you know what we're about to run. Can you set this up? Yeah, I had been um, I had been at a comfortable distance thinking that, you know, we knew that there was going to be the joint session of Congress, which was going to be kind of a farcical um, attempt at a, at a coup, right? We knew that there were going to be these objections to the Electoral College certification, Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, there would be these debates, there would be these votes, they would get voted down. And I was over in Georgetown watching on television, um, expecting to cover it that way. Um, and then when the riot started, um, I got in a car pretty fast with my crew and drove up to the that side of the Capitol where the Supreme Court is and got out of the car and then went straight in. Um, Jim, let's roll this clip. This is a sad, pathetic aftermath of this utter show. Hello. 12 more years! John, what was it like to be in that crowd? Uh, disconcerting. Um, and I mean, we uh, had gone around the side of the Capitol at that point to where the biggest crowd on the outside was still uh, gathered. And, and as Mark said, the riot, the height of the riot had ended at that point, but the Capitol was not secure at that point. So a lot of riot police were just arriving. As everybody knows, the National Guard was very late to the scene and um, they had still not dispersed. A lot of those people were still loitering around. Some of the people who had been inside were now outside. Some of the people who were on the outside were still trying to get in. And uh, in that crowd, you know, one of the things about that we all know, having covered various Trump rallies over the last four years, is there's not just a lot of hostility towards the media, but a lot of like, they're very tuned in to seeing people with cameras. There's a lot of like immediate kind of like, who are you with? Are you fake news? What are you saying? So if you're trying to do what we do, and I'm kind of doing running commentary as I'm walking through the crowd and narrating things or making observations, I'm also kind of constantly looking around trying to make sure that when I hear people leaning in to listen to what I'm saying, that I'm not going to say something that's going to be, that's going to lead down a bad path. So I was kind of trying both to do the journalistic thing and, and report on it, but also trying to make sure that my crew and I were didn't get into a melee, and the, the tighter the crowd was, the more you realize that if they turn on you, there might not be a way out. Um, so we were very attuned to all of that, and then that that either shot or flashbang went off. I don't, I still don't know whether which it was. It didn't sound to me in the end like a like a shot, like a gunshot. I think it was a flashbang thrown by a riot police. But at the moment, you don't really know that. So we kind of, as you could see, I kind of shuddered there and then turned around to get out as quick as I could. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, as you, the other thing you can see on my face there as we walked up is, you know, just there's so much to say about what we've been experiencing these last week or so and it's and the story gets worse and worse by the day by the hour the more we know about this about the possibility of collaborationist republicans who may have been the kind of in congealing conventional wisdom among a lot of democrats and some republicans that there were that this was an inside job um just the extent of the violence the degree that you know the reporting now that we know these rioters were there to kidnap and kill assassinate political leaders but even in that moment before i knew any of that it was just heartbreaking you know to see this happened at the Capitol, a place that I've been, you know, visiting and covering since 1980. You know, I worked on Capitol Hill when I first got out of college, 1987. Um, to see that spectacle there, I just, I found it, I was on the, kind of on the brink of tears for most of that session as we walked around. And I, in a lot of ways, still feel like that right now. We have to take a break, but we'll be right back with more Mark McKinnon, Alex Wagner, and John Heilman from the circus. <laughs> 